if the U.S. government doesn't take a massive initiative, I think they're going to regret it within three to five years. Welcome to the Artificial Intelligence Show, the podcast that helps your business grow smarter by making AI approachable and actionable. My name is Paul Reitzer. I'm the founder and CEO of Marketing AI Institute, and I'm your host. Each week, I'm joined by my co-host and Marketing AI Institute Chief Content Officer, Mike Kaput, as we break down all the AI news that matters and give you insights and perspectives that you can use to advance your company and your career. Join us as we accelerate AI literacy for all. Welcome to episode 102 of the Artificial Intelligence Show. I'm your host, Paul Reitzer, along with my co-host, Mike Kaput. This is our last episode for a little while. Mike and I have some travel and some commitments coming up, so we are going to take a little uh, two-week summer break. So episode 103 is currently scheduled for July 2nd. Now, if OpenAI drops GPT-5 on the world sometime <laughs> between now and then, I may show up for an emergency pod. But uh, just to keep in mind, mark your calendar, July 2nd would be the next episode. Um, also, thank you to everyone that joined us for the AI for B2B Marketers Summit. Uh, you probably heard us talk about that on previous episodes. It was a huge success. We had almost 4,000 people from 92 countries join us for that event. So it was an incredible half-day virtual summit. It was the inaugural one. Um, yeah, I mean, just we could probably spend a half hour talking about all the amazing stuff there. The chat was incredible. Uh, I think at our peak, we had 1,900 people on simultaneously. Yeah. So, you know, for a free event to have over 50% attendance was pretty remarkable. So, yeah, just great stuff. Thanks to all the speakers who gave their time and insights for that event, uh, our team, um, and just everybody who joined us and was so active in the chat and the community. We are grateful for that. We will be doing it again next year. We didn't announce any dates or anything, but we'll definitely be back with another AI for B2B Markers Summit next year. Okay, uh, this episode is brought to us by the new Scaling AI for Business Leaders series. This has been, we haven't talked about this, I don't think, on the show, have we, Mike? I, I no, think I don't think new. so. Okay. <laughs> So scalingai.com is the website. This has been the last, well, I've been working on this for about two years. Um, I, I told Mike and I told the team, like, this was probably more um, mental weight and time than writing a book. Uh, so I've, I, I've been thinking about it and planning it for a couple of years, but I've been intensely working on it for about three months. And then last week was sort of the final push. And so I actually, um, today is Tuesday, July or, or June 11th on Sunday, I spent nine hours in studio recording the 10 courses. So scaling AI is going to be an on-demand course series. It's launching June 27th and we're going to launch it with a free webinar. So this is the, you know, brought to you by, so go to scalingai.com. On June 27th at noon Eastern, we are going to do five essential steps to scaling AI in your organization. The way I think about this is we get approached all the time to help people build their AI roadmaps. So when I finish my keynotes, I'll often end with five steps. I'll tell you, know, focus on education and training, build an AI council, develop responsible AI principles, generate AI policies, run AI impact or exposure assessments on your team and tech and partners and then build your AI roadmap. And we inevitably get people coming up to us saying, can you do this for us? And we, we don't do it. Um, we do some very limited advisory work and consulting work, but it's the kind of thing, like if we were to go in from the ground up and do this, or if we were to scale a consulting practice to do this kind of work, I mean, you're probably talking about, I, I, I don't know, like one to two to $3 million of consulting work. If you wanted someone to come in and like truly do this entire thing. It's a, it's a massive undertaking to do this in an organization with so many variables to consider. And so our choice is more of a one to many model. We are trying to make this knowledge as accessible to as many organizations as possible. So rather than me or Mike going in and spending three months with one company, I spent three months building 10 courses that any company can apply the framework to. So, um, that's kind of the gist of it. There's a welcome to the series, a state of AI for business, uh, the AI forward organization. So the imperative to build AI native or AI emergent organization, how to build an AI council, 
building an internal AI academy, generative AI policies, responsible AI principles, the impact assessments, the AI roadmap, and then what's next, agents, AGI, and beyond. Those are the 10 courses in the series. So you can go to scalingai.com, learn more about that. We'll talk more about it as we, you know, I guess in July when we, we we're back together. But uh, again, scalingai.com, you can register for free for the five essential steps to scaling AI in your organization, a June 27th webinar. Um, okay, we, as we talked about last week, we delayed this episode by one day so that we could talk about everything Apple, which we now know is Apple intelligence. So mm -hmm. we're going to kick off today with a deep dive into the Apple WWDC event. And then we got plenty more to get to after that. So I will turn it over to Mike to guide us into the Apple discussion. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. So yes, we are right in the thick of WWDC, the Worldwide Developer Conference, an annual event from Apple. It's happening over the next couple of days as we're recording this, but really what we were focused on is trying to see what Apple is doing with artificial intelligence as announced during its opening keynote. And they certainly told us because the first and kind of biggest AI announcement that came out of the keynote at WWDC is something that the company is calling Apple Intelligence, which is conveniently abbreviated AI. And this is a suite of AI features that are now going to be baked right into all Apple devices. So according to Apple, quote, Apple Intelligence is the personal intelligence system that puts powerful generative models right at the core of your iPhone, iPad, and Mac empowers incredible new features to help users communicate, work, and express themselves. So this includes a number of different Gen AI features, things like AI text generation, image generation, and photo editing. There's also an integration with ChatGPT, so you can access that right through iOS. And very much anticipated, there is now going to be a much smarter version of Siri, which is Apple's voice assistant. Siri will have highly upgraded conversational features and the ability to actually take some actions for you across your apps. So kind of a big draw of this whole Apple intelligence system was kind of how contextual it promises to be. So again, according to Apple, quote, awareness of your personal context enables Siri to help you in ways that are unique to you. Can't remember if a friend shared that recipe with you in a note, a text, or an email. Need your passport number while booking a flight? Siri can use its knowledge of the information on your device to help you find what you're looking for without compromising your privacy. And indeed, that last bit is important because Apple made privacy a pretty big talking point of its Apple intelligence rollout. And they kept kind of emphasizing that while Apple intelligence can understand the context of all your personal information, it is not collecting that information. It's using what Apple is calling private cloud compute to, quote, handle more complex requests while protecting your privacy. So all of this was kind of a preview of what's coming. All the Apple intelligence and Siri features are going to become publicly available to all us users later this year on the iPhone 15 Pro, the iPhone 15 Pro Max, iPads, and Macs with M1 chips or later. So Paul, you're, you know, a longtime Apple watcher. What were your impressions of the releases and what do they kind of mean for where Apple now stands in this AI arms race we find ourselves in? So it was interesting. You know, we've always been waiting for this for a really long time, but I was golfing yesterday. We had, so I'm on the board for Junior Achievement of Greater Cleveland. I've been on the board there for, oh gosh, almost 10 years. And so I was out golfing with our friend, Joe Polizzi. So we were um, in a cart together and it happened we teed off at 1230 and the thing starts at one. So Joe and I, in between shots, have um, the, the presentation like streaming on our phones. So I was kind of catching bits and pieces and, and I would catch a little bits at a time. And then I got home late last night and that's when I started kind of really diving in. And so I, I, I'm going to try and structure this just kind of like some very high level takeaways. I'm not going to get into like a lot of the nitty gritty of all the features. There's some really cool stuff coming. So my first thought was no major wow moments, like nothing. Mm unexpected, splashy, wildly innovative. That was like, wow, I didn't see that coming. 
That being said, they did what they had to do. Um, and I think the key takeaway, and I don't think like the average Apple user is going to know or care about this, but they're doing it on their own chips, their own devices, with their own privacy controls. And the biggest thing to me was on their own models. Now, they've been unusually um, open about their research in recent months. They've shared some of the research that sort of was a prelude to this, that they were working on these kind of on-device models. But I think this was my biggest takeaway is they did this the Apple way, which is um, maintaining and building trust with the user. So I've said this before on, on the podcast, and you know, I think it's worth repeating. When we think about all the possibilities of people building AI agents to help take actions and connect to your apps and do all these things, the end of the day, I trust Apple more than any other company. So I trust that they will build the safest, most secure, most human centric models. And that's exactly what they're doing. So they focused a lot. I read this, they have a machine learning, uh, research arm and that, that arm published a paper, like how their models work. And so I was actually focused on that last night. And so they talk about the fact that they take like a, a base model and then they fine tune for specific use cases around communication, work, expressing ourselves and then getting things done across Apple products. And that's exactly what they demonstrated. So I think what people have to do is separate this. We talk so much about Anthropic and Google building these massive frontier models and open AI and others. That is not Apple's play. That is not what they're trying to do here. They are going to, rather than build and release like these general purpose models pursuing AGI, they're focused on fine tuned, efficient models that enhance the user experience and solve for real world applications. That's the Apple way. Well, why? Think about what Apple's mission statement is. It is to bring the best user experience to its customers through innovative hardware, software, and services. That's what this does. Contrast that with OpenAI's mission is to ensure that artificial general intelligence benefits all of humanity. So we have one company going and building massive frontier models that are gonna be general purpose and maybe achieve AGI at some point this decade. And you Apple saying we have billions of devices, we're just gonna make people's lives better, like one feature at a time to where it becomes like frictionless and they don't even have to think about it. So the Apple way is models are trained on licensed data um, or they give you the opportunity to opt out very easily if you don't want your data in, infused in their models from the web. Um, profanity is actually removed from the training data. They build algorithms to remove harmful content, which you know, they would consider profanity harmful content. Um, they have image generation, but you can't do lifelike images. You can do sketches, illustrations, or animations. When they evaluate how the models perform, they don't use the standard industry evals. They use human evals to benchmark models against things people actually do on devices. So they're looking at communication, work, expression of self. So they use these, th th then they also look at um, evals against harmfulness and their models dominate. Like if you go look at their data in these reports, they are the safest um, and they are the least harmful models out there. Like if you compare it to Mistral, it was, it was, it was scary. <laughs> like Mistral's <laughs> model is not safe. Um, and then everything stays on device or in their private cloud that they introduce. So that is very much the Apple way. And so that was actually, I think my biggest question mark, one was what were they gonna do with Surrey? Two was what is this open AI partnership gonna be? Are they yeah. gonna give up all of their models to open AI? Like that seemed impossible to me knowing Apple's approach. So that then takes me into the open AI part of it. I honestly, like, I just expected more. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I actually think they made the right play not going deeper with OpenAI, but it's, it, the way it works is the ChatGPT is built in. So on, on the Apple intelligence site, it says with ChatGPT from OpenAI integrated into Surrey and writing tools, you get even more expertise when it might be helpful for you. Meaning if you need the power of a general model, a frontier model, we're going to make it seamless for you. You don't have to pay for it. So you're getting ChatGPT capabilities for free on your phone if you want it and then you can choose like they'll alert you saying hey this information goes to open ai it's like anonymized and things like that but they're just letting you know each time you're making a choice to leave the protection of the apple bubble basically so um i, I like the big thing with for me was like are they going to turn surrey like are they just going to use open ai's voice capabilities in surrey and they did mm -hmm. not do that and they actually left it open to infuse Gemini and other models later. Like they basically said, like, this isn't an exclusive thing. We're just going to make it easy for you to get access to these models if you want. 
So I think the Apple intelligence thing makes a ton of sense. I think they demonstrated their chip, you know, capability, the, the hardware being a differentiator, their ability to manufacture and build intelligence into devices is unparalleled. Um, those are a couple of things. Then you get into like, well, is this going to actually work? We've all over the last year and a half seen plenty of AI demonstrations that are like, yeah, that was great. Like in a year and a half later, we're still waiting for it to be able to do that. Um, but Andrej Karpathy, you know, who we often talk about on the show, he tweeted that he was impressed, but then he said, you know, someone said, oh yeah, but it's just demos. And he's like, I, I agree. Like the proof will be in the pudding, but I will say that I think the technology exists to do what they're showing. Like there's, there's nothing that they would need to invent that isn't already possible. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the, the last couple of things, Surrey, that, again, this was the big one I was waiting for. So if you go to the page and you read about, you know, what they're doing, um, they say the start of a new era for Surrey. And that was the one thing like in between going up to the tee box and coming back, my initial impression up front was like, oh, they're, they're introducing some stuff, but it sounds like a year from now, here's what we might do with Surrey. So I think we're going to have a much more useful Surrey this fall. Like it's going to have the on-screen awareness you talked about. It's going to know what's on the screen and be able to do it, but protect it on your device. Like only mm -hmm. you and your device are aware of this. It's going to know personal context from the information on the device. It's going to have the ability to start taking actions, kind of functioning as an agent. It's going to help with summarization and proofreading and, you know, mail replies. And it's like, it's going to start doing these things. Um, but they're doing it in this really unique way where they're building what are called these adapters that actually functions on top of the main model. And so the model stays kind of in its, its, its um, static state almost. And then the adapters like evolve and learn. And so I think what it might lead to, um, you know, I've heard a couple of people who I respect say like, this was the biggest thing they've done since the iPhone, which is not the initial reaction you heard. A lot of people are like, meh, like it didn't seem like a big deal, but I think what they're doing with Surrey and where it's going to go. And by building all these really efficient models right on the phone and being able to do all these things on device, if you think about what the iPhone did, it changed the computing inter interface to touch. Like it, it enabled us to touch screen everything. I, I think now we will, we will start entering the era of the voice interface, like a true voice mm -hmm. interface where it's able to do everything on your Mac, on your iPhone, on your iPad, with your AirPods, eventually probably with, you know, something beyond the vision pro that's more, um, everyday life kind of glasses. And so I think that voice starts to become a very, very important interface for humans with their devices in a very reliable way that maybe we haven't had before. And then my final note is the stock was down like 1.8% on the day. That was the kink Joe and I kept going like <laughs> after something would happen, we'd be like, okay, check their stock real quick. Oh, go check Microsoft stock. Like we were kind of watching the, how was the market responding? And so I would say that down one and a half to 2% was a meh from the market. Like, uh, it's up 15%, I think, since, since March, kind of you know, anticipating this news. Um, my thought was it could swing 5 to 10% either way, based on whether the market thought what they were doing was incredible or not. And the fact that it was like 1%, 2% was just kind of like, eh. So I don't, I don't think the market's pricing in the potential value of everything they've done, but I also don't think they penalized them for not doing anything massively innovative. That's a great assessment. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this piece, but we should also mention that Elon Musk came out guns blazing pretty immediately. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right, right. None of this is news, but basically he claims he is going to consider banning Apple devices at his companies because they're integrating OpenAI's tech at the operating system level. And at one point he posted... Quote, it's patently absurd that Apple isn't smart enough to make their own AI, yet is somehow capable of ensuring that open AI will protect your security and privacy. So seems like there's some criticism here. This is not any surprise, but we probably should expect. <laughs> I had to laugh because he got community noted right away. Yeah, so he's such yeah. a big fan of these community notes <laughs> and he got community noted hard on, on this. And then, um, uh, Marquez Brown, Brownlee, who we love, you know, does amazing product reviews and stuff and was at the Apple event. Uh, he tweeted and he's like, listen, I, I asked them directly what you're saying isn't true. Like, it's not, this isn't how it's going to work. Uh, my, I mean, when I saw the tweets around, I was like, man, he really hates open AI. Like this is all about a vendetta <laughs> yeah. against open AI. It's like, 
that immediate overreaction and, and making this assumption that your data is going to go there where, and you, yeah, people are going to have to, like, if they're coming to SpaceX or Tesla, put their iPhones in a Faraday cage. So like, come on, like it was just an overreaction. Um, so yeah, this is what it is. All right. So our next big topic this week is a little bit of a weird one, but a very important one. So we recently are hearing a lot about a guy named Leopold Aschenbrenner, who's a former super alignment researcher at OpenAI. He was making waves in the AI community with a series of pretty thought-provoking essays and interviews on the rapid approach of AGI and possibly eventually super intelligence. Ashenbrenner is also notable because he was fired in April from OpenAI for allegedly leaking confidential information. This is an allegation he's kind of contextualized on popular podcasts like the Dwar Kesh podcast, which we both love, basically saying he simply shared an AI safety document that he was working on with some outside researchers after, you know, making sure there was no sensitive info in it. We can, you know, talk about that piece, but really what's getting everyone's attention is this very extensive thesis that he's laid out both in interviews and in a series of related essays that are about 150 pages long or so called Situational Awareness, The Decade Ahead. And basically in them, he claims that he's one of perhaps right now a few hundred AI insiders who are seeing signals that say we are going to have super intelligence, quote, in the true sense of the word, by the end of the decade, and that AGI by 2027 is, quote, strikingly plausible. He then goes on to lay out very extensive arguments over why that is the case. Furthermore, he also makes kind of a big argument here that this fact happening is going to kick off some serious competition between the United States and China in a national security race to basically build and control AGI. And it's a race that he says, if we screw it up, could lead to all out war. So, you know, that's fun. But basically, he's arguing that, look, I'm seeing a bunch of talk in San Francisco shift from $10 billion compute clusters to $100 billion clusters to trillion dollar clusters. So basically, there's this infrastructure kind of arms race kicking off. And he says the AGI race has begun. We are building machines that can think and reason. By 2025, 26, these machines will outpace many college graduates. By the end of the decade, they will be smarter than you or I. Before long, the world will wake up. But right now, there are perhaps a few hundred people, most of them in San Francisco and the AI labs that have situational awareness. So, Paul, there's a ton to unpack here. I'm personally only about halfway through the full set of essays. They seem really, really good. But let's kind of take this one step at a time. First, maybe walk us through your thoughts on Leo Ashenbrenner and just like his overall thesis, like how seriously should we be taking him and his perspective? So I think, you know, anybody who's listened to this podcast for a long time or even this last tap out tap episodes knows we try and take a very balanced approach to all this. We try and listen to the EAC people and, you know, the techno optimist crowd that's accelerated at all costs. We try and share their perspectives. We share the perspectives of the doomers, um, you know, the people who have a high P doom, as they would call it, the probability of doom that, you know, this is all going to go really sideways. And then Mike and I generally kind of fall in the realist realm. We try and accept that there's different perspectives and we try and uncover, you know, the, the directional truth within those perspectives. And we try and figure out what might actually happen. And so. I definitely try not to get caught up, but I, I also listen. So I listened to the whole Thor question, which I think was almost like three hours long. Yeah. Um, I was familiar with Leopold. I was actually following him on Twitter, but I, I didn't know deeply, you know, his background that he was a valedictorian of Columbia at age 19, you know, started college at 15. Um, he's obviously a genius. Um, and, and so I think that's, uh, his intelligence matters here. Like, this is someone who has a proven history of being able to analyze things very deeply, learn topics very quickly. He's been on the inside at the super intelligence team. The situational awareness document you mentioned is dedicated to Ilya Sutskova, who hmm. we've talked about many times. Ilya was uh, Leopold's boss. Probably I would imagine on the super alignment team is probably who he reported to. 
um, the whole thing is based on this premise of scaling laws that we have talked about on the show many times, that there are a lot of leading AI researchers who currently see uh, a continued predictable trend in the computing power that we, you know, give it more chips, that these algorithms used to do the computation are becoming more efficient. They're able to get more out of these chips because they find efficiencies through algorithmic gains. And then what he turns on hobbling is there's these things that are sort of in the way of progress, but there aren't any things that they don't think they can solve. So basically there's a bunch of like dumb things that kind of get in the way or prevent the, the progress from happening, but they think that they're largely able to get through a lot of these things through the reinforcement learning through human feedback, giving it chain of thought reasoning, uh, giving it tools or just kind of like improving the algorithms. And so the whole premise of this is we are following these scaling laws. And if we follow these, then there's these predictable leaps that will be made from GPT-2 to GPT-3 to 4 to 5 to 6. And they, being, you know, these few hundred people who are at the forefront of this, don't see any signs that this won't hold true. And so if you go back to episode 87, this was what I was talking about. Like, this is exactly the theory. So I, I mean, I've been reading this with great interest because it aligns with a lot of the timeline stuff we were talking about, and it sort of goes much deeper in a lot of key areas, um, that I've been sort of waiting for people to start talking more about. So I was pretty excited when I saw this. So what I'm going to do is I'll just recap the couple of sections. It is dense. Like, as you <laughs> said, like, like it's, it's long. I would give this to Gemini and like have a conversation yeah. with Google Gemini about it probably. Um, okay. So the, the first chapter is, um, from GPT to AGI counting the ooms and oom means order of magnitude. Uh, 10x improvement equals one order of magnitude. So it's just kind of like some technical terminology, but ooms is a critical concept here because he basically goes through and says, hey, to go from this to, you know, three ooms of compute is a $100 billion cluster. And we already know that Microsoft and OpenAI are rumored to be working on that. And that seems plausible. Now, the the big stuff, like the, the super intelligence starts bumping into limitations of infrastructure and energy, which we talked about as the limitation on episode 87. Um, but so that's the, the first section is AGI by 2027 is strikingly plausible. GPT-2 to GPT-4 took us from preschooler to smart uh, high schooler abilities. Tracing these trend lines, we should go from preschool to high schooler size qualitative jump by 2027. The second section was um, from AGI to super intelligence, the intelligence explosion. AI progress won't stop at human level. Hundreds of millions of AGIs could automate AI research compressing a decade of algorithmic progress, five plus ooms, uh, into one year, we would rapidly go from human level to vastly superhuman AI systems. The power and peril of superintelligence would be dramatic. The third section is racing to the trillion dollar cluster. The most extraordinary techno capital, capital acceleration has been set in motion. As AI revenue grows rapidly, many trillions of dollars will go into GPU data center and power build out before the end of the decade, the industrial mobilization, including growing U.S. electricity production by tens of percent will be intense. The third, and this gets into the thing you talked about China, the nations uh, that locked down the lab, securing uh, security for AGI. This was a big part of his focus on the mm -hmm. Dwarkesh podcast. The nation's leading AI labs treat security as an afterthought. It was terrifying to hear him talk about what's happening in these labs. And then ironically, 24 hours after this podcast dropped, OpenAI drops a blog post talking about how they're handling security. So hit a nerve for sure. Um, and they were trying to kind of like fight back from a PR perspective against some of it, but I don't think they have much ground to stand on. I think what he's saying is probably true. Um, it says currently they're basically hand, handing the key secrets for AGI to uh, CCP on a silver platter, securing the AGI secrets and weights against state actor threat will be an immense effort and we're not on track. The, the next section was super alignment, which they dissolved that team that he was on with Ilya. Reliably controlling AI systems much smarter than we are is an unsolved technical problem. And while it is a solvable problem, things could very easily go off the rails during a rapid intelligence explosion. Managing this will be extremely tense. Failure could be uh, easily catastrophic. The, the next, the free world must prevail. Super intelligence will give a decisive economic and military advantage. Um, in the race to AGI, the free world's very survival will be at stake. Again, this is where some people are like, ah, this is a little much. 
And it may be, but he's got some really good data. Hmm. Um, and then the project, I, I specifically like this one because this is my, I, I'm not like saying this is the hill I'm going to die on yet, but this is kind of the direction I'm, I'm going. I'll explain the context here. As the race to AGI intensifies, the national security state will get involved. Um, U.S. government will wake from its slumber and by 27, 28, we'll get some form of government AGI project. No startup can handle super intelligence somewhere in a skiff, um, secure. What does that stand for? Secure. Yeah, it's like, I forget what the acronym is, but it's where they securely brief people Correct. with intelligence briefings. Like you cannot like have devices in there and stuff. Forget what it, I'll have to look up what it. Yeah. Look, you can look up while I'm rambling here. So the, the end game. Was. So here's my feeling. I don't believe that the current administration, nor the former administration in the United States, nor based on the current candidates, either administration that will come, has the will and the vision to do what is likely needed. And that is a Apollo level and beyond project to build and control the infrastructure necessary for the intelligence explosion. So the United States government, and again, I know we have listeners all around the world and you know, other governments should be doing something similar. But in the United States, in the 1960s, when we said we're going to put, a, put humans on the moon, it was a decade long initiative that at its peak was 6% of the entire, entire federal budget was going to the Apollo program to build the rockets that would put us on the moon. We need that. Like there needs to be an, an effort made by the government. Now, 6% wouldn't be enough. The, based on my research this morning, the budget in the United States is 1.7 trillion. The actual annual outlay, the spending is 6.5 trillion. 6% isn't sufficient. You, you can't be spending a couple hundred billion. So in the, the Apollo program was 25 billion over a decade, which is the equivalent of about 250 billion in today's dollars. That's not going to cut it. We, we need trillions. So if I was the U S government, I would be aggressively putting a plan in place to spend trillions of dollars over the next five to 10 years to house all the infrastructure in the United States, to keep all the best companies, the chip builders, the intelligence builders in the United States, because it is an imperative for the security of the country and for the economic viability in the future. So, um, that, that like, I think if anything, I'm sure there's people in Congress reading this. I'm sure yeah. they're being briefed as we speak. If the U S government doesn't take a massive initiative, um, I think they're, there's, they're going to regret it in within three to five years, a massive regret because there's no open AI can build whatever they're going to build. Nvidia can build whatever they're going to build unless we build the infrastructure to allow it to prosper. And we do it in, in the United States. Like it, it's just not going to happen. They're going to run up against energy issues. They're going to run up against electricity issues. They're going to run up against, you know, where the data center is going to go. And the $10 billion chips act the U S did was nice start, but 10 billion in, isn't doing it. It's, that's not going to cut. I mean, Anthropics raised 7 billion on their own already. So that was like one of the things. And then I'll just end with the kind of the, the synopsis he gives at the end, I thought was pretty solid. So he says, what if we're right? And this is the big question for me is, is there like a 30% chance he's right? That that's good enough for me. Like 30% solid. Um, we should probably be really aggressively assessing this possibility if we're in even 10%. Um, and I think it's higher than that. I, I think that the direction he's saying this goes, there's probably at least a 50, 50 chance that he's, he's right. Um, that would get, that should get action. So he says, what if we're right before the decade is out, we will have super intelligence. This is what most of the series is about. Um, you mentioned there's like a few people in, in, you know, basically in San Francisco who have this situational awareness that are aware of this. Um, it's hard to contemplate. People think deep learning is going to hit this wall, but they don't. But then he takes on like, Hey, the doomers, they're obsessed with, uh, AGI for years, give them a lot of credit for their prescience. But, um, basically they're, they're not thinking about this the right way. These claims of doom and calls for indefinite pause are clearly not the way, like we can't just stop. And then he says on the other end, we have the EACs and they're narrowly focused on like some good points and progress must, conti must continue. But, and I love this, beyond, beneath their shallow Twitter shit posting, they are a sham. And he just kind of straight up says, like, this is all for them to just build um, their own products around it and chatbots and basically make some money, you know, capitalistic approach to this. We're just going to make some money off of this thing. So 
he, he says the core tenets are super intelligence is a matter of national security, which I agree with hundred percent. America must lead. If you're in America, you're going to agree with that. I would say democratic societies much must lead, you know, NATO must lead. Like, I think that th that's more of the approach here is we need an international effort to have democratic values and democratic governments that, that do this, that would probably be a better outcome for society. And then like, we need to not screw it up. So he says the, if we're right, these are the people that have invented and built it. They think AGI will be developed this decade. And though there's a fairly wide spectrum, many of them take very seriously the possibility that the road to super intelligence will play out as I've described in this series. On the Dark Dwar Kesh podcast, they talk about these like private parties where all the researchers from DeepMind mm -hmm. and OpenAI and Anthropic all hang out together and compare notes. And they're all kind of on the same page here of where this goes. So he says, like, I could get some of this wrong, but realistically, like, this is kind of what we think is going to happen. And so then he said, as you mentioned, right now, there are perhaps a few hundred people in the world who realize what's about to hit us, who understand just how crazy things are about to get, who have situational awareness. I probably either personally know or am one degree of separation from everyone who could plausibly run the project, which is the, the big Apollo type mission I mentioned. The few folks behind the scenes who are desperately trying to keep things from falling apart are you and your buddies and their buddies. That's it. That's all there is. Someday it will be out of our hands, but right now, at least for the next few years of mid game, the fate of the world rests on these people. Oh yeah, man. It that's was like, a quote. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I mean, I was, when I was listening to their question podcast, I was like, holy. Shit. And, and then mm. I, you know, I was reading the report and I'm like, man, like there's a lot to process here. And I, I honestly don't disagree with any of it. Like there was nothing in there. I was like, oh, okay, this is an exaggeration. I was like, no, he's following scaling laws. And if these stay true, everything he's saying is plausible. Like there's nothing in this that isn't a leap um, to think it's, it's doable. And then it gets into the thing we've always said with the AI timeline episode 87. I was like, we have to figure out what does this mean? And I think this is kind of reinforcing that. It's like, hey, we're further laying out the possibility here what does it mean to government? What does it mean to business? What does it mean to society? What does it mean to educational systems? What does it mean to human purpose? Like it's, yeah, it's, it, it's important. Like it's, I know this is a lot and it's kind of overwhelming. Um, but we all have to really start like thinking about these things. We're talking about a few years. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I mean, if you're, if you have a kid who's a freshman in high school, by the time they graduate, they're saying this is, this is, where it might be by the time they go to college. That's how fast this is going to happen. Fun, fun fact of how small, you know, that community is who, a uh, person we talked about, uh, I believe last week, Avital Balwit, who was writing the, my last five years of work essay, uh, also advised on this writing among many other people. So a lot of people were tweeting the saying, this is important. You, yes. you need to read this. And my guess is they're all the people who are in the private parties yep. sharing notes. All right. And last but not least, a skiff is a sensitive compartmented information facility. Perhaps. I wouldn't have got that. So, okay. I would have gotten I'm, like one letter. I knew what it was, but I didn't know yeah. 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 the initials stood for. <laughs> yeah. All right. So in our third big topic this week, Paul, there's been an update to Adobe's terms of service that has them facing some pretty significant backlash. Um, on the surface, these updates seem kind of run of the mill and small. There's just like a few paragraph changes, but they're having this really big impact because these changes to the terms of service resulted in this pop up where users had to agree to give Adobe access to user content through what it calls, quote, automated and manual methods or become unable to use the software. So you had to opt into this again. Some users are really taking issue with language in the terms of service that appears to give Adobe sweeping ownership over work created with Adobe products. And so a lot of creators are now worried that Adobe is going to be training all its AI models on their work. So this backlash has prompted a response from Adobe and they released a blog post stating that this is all kind of a big misunderstanding. Basically, they said, quote, we recently made an update to our terms of use with the goal of providing more clarity on a few specific areas and pushed a routine reacceptance of those terms to Adobe Creative Cloud and Document Cloud customers. 
They clarified the policies and reiterated that they don't train on customer content and will never assume ownership of a customer's work. So Paul, I think like what really stands out here is, you know, not getting into the nitty gritty of one policy versus another, but like this caused a severe and pretty immediate backlash from people. Like, are you seeing this where just kind of highlighted to me how skeptical and untrusting basically a lot of consumers are about these companies using their work in any way? Yeah, I mean, we talk about this with OpenAI. It's just an unforced error. It's like, I don't know if legal got more control than communications, which is usually the case with stuff like this, but uh, it, it's just it's just a bad look. Um, it may be deceptive practices. I don't I don't know. I wouldn't like accuse Adobe of that. I, I don't I don't know particularly, but it, it doesn't look good. Um, the forcing you to accept it without like really going into detail about it and having it be a lot of like technical legal lingo that I mean I read it I was like yeah. I don't even know what that means and yeah. you and I are pretty um knowledgeable about, about this stuff and I didn't understand the terms um yeah I, I mean we saw this with zoom last year where they did something where it's like so are you recording when I record in zoom are you training your models mm. on our confidential conversations because that's what your terms sure sound like and then they have to like pull back like no 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 that's not what it means and we're sorry like, like there was a misunderstanding and I just think that there's going to be an increasing level of mistrust. And I think that we need to expect more of these companies to be very transparent and clear and not even give the perception that they're trying to pull one over on us real fast with their fancy legal language that isn't really understandable to anyone but a lawyer on the Adobe team. <laughs> so. Yeah, I just I, I kind of treat this one as a rapid fire, almost in a way like bad look. Um, we need to expect more from companies. We talked about uh, HubSpot's uh, AI cards a few weeks yeah. back. Seems like a much better approach. Uh, I, I haven't gone deep on HubSpot's terms, but I think we just need more of that, more just transparency. Here's what it is. Like you know, click here to learn more. I I, I don't know, but. Um, yeah, this is going to be a problem. There's going to be a lot of companies wanting access to your data to use in their AI in some way, and it's going to get really confusing how they're doing it. Yeah, definitely a lesson for any companies building AI out there. People are very, very sensitive to this. Yeah. All right, so let's dive into some rapid fires. And the first one is somewhat related here because Microsoft is also facing some backlash against a new pretty hyped up AI feature. Now we covered this feature on episode 99. It's called Recall and it is due to ship with Microsoft's new line of Copilot Plus PCs. Recall is AI that basically screenshots everything you see and do on your machine so that you can search and reference this material later. And Microsoft says this is all recorded and stored locally on device for security purposes and that its AI is not trained on this data. However, it's now come to light from some security, cybersecurity researchers who have done early tests of the product that contrary to Microsoft's statements, it may actually be possible to extract this data from uh, recall totally remotely from a user's machine. So this basically prompted Microsoft to change course immediately and mandate that recall be turned off by default on the machines. Previously, it was going to be default turn on. So, Paul, I think, you know, you kind of when we talked about this on episode 99, you kind of called this one saying that this feature was going to be a slippery slope within companies due to privacy concerns. Is that kind of what you took away from this debacle? Yeah, 100 percent. Like. Again, like it just, I don't know. There's like sometimes the stuff get announced and you're like, really? Like, like that, you're just going to turn it on, Nate? Like, we haven't really thought through how much people are going to hate this <laughs> offering and like not want everything on their device recorded every five seconds. Um, and how easily it's going to be to hack it, even though you say it's like secure, it's actually saved in a text file and you can get that text file pretty easily. It's already been proven. Like, yeah. I mean, I think Microsoft does a lot of stuff. Right. I, I don't know that this um, concept was fully baked at the time and that they thought through all the all the challenges they were that, that people were going to have to it. And um, yeah, I think they now know and 
<laughs> they'll retrench a little bit and adapt. That's I mean, we see this all the time though, like Google racing out AI overviews, Microsoft yeah. pushing out this stuff. Like everyone is racing to out innovate the other player and companies that historically were really smart about releases are, are just, there's just things being missed in the race to get stuff to market. And, and sometimes it's just simple communications and I don't know, like user experience and you know, anticipating user feedback. I don't, I don't know. Maybe when we get to AGI, we'll just ask the AGI, Hey, what could go wrong with this product? And it'll tell us, and then we won't do these things. Yeah. Yeah. In the meantime, some, uh, PR and crisis communications might be helpful. Yeah. Don't fire your communications people. You yeah. still, you still need your communications people to think this stuff through. All right. So in our next topic, we're actually going to highlight what is turning out to be a pretty important AI public service announcement. So this comes from Chris Bach, who is an entrepreneur who now works at X. And he posted a really important, though it's a bit tongue in cheek, kind of reminder that everyone needs to really be paying attention to how their staff may be using AI tools. So what Bach posted says, quote, we're not fully prepared for a world in which 20 year old summer interns are uploading thousands of pages of proprietary company financial and product information to some LOM company that has just raised 2.2 million and hasn't gotten around to creating a terms of service or privacy policy yet. Now, Paul, this is definitely a little bit sarcastic, kind of pretty common for Chris to uh, post on X like this, but it, it is really like a pretty important point. I mean, right now I see a lot of organizations that do not really have robust policies in place to regulate how staff are using any type of AI tool and like don't understand the risks. Like how do we prevent this scenario he outlined from happening? Yeah, I, I thought it was hilarious. Yeah. Um, and so, so true. That was the yeah. crazy part. So what we know is um, people are, are using AI. So we talked about the, the LinkedIn Microsoft report, 75% of already using AI at work, 46% of that started in the last six months. Um, a good percentage of them, I was trying to find the stat right now, but it was like in 40% are using unapproved tools. Um, mm. And then another 40 some percent are using tools that are outlawed. <laughs> so. And then there's this, also in the LinkedIn Microsoft report, it says employees across every age group are bringing their own AI tools to work. So let's say you hire an intern for the summer and that intern is responsible for using some sensitive or confidential data, and they're not allowed to use chat GPT at, at the office. It's shut off. 85% of Gen Z workers are bringing their own AI tools to work. Millennials, 78%, Gen X, 76%, and the boomers, 73%. People are going to use AI, whether you allow them to or not, is the point here. And this, the same goes for schools. Like the students are going to use the AI tools, whether you want them to or not, you have to put the policies in place to get them to do it responsibly. This is the whole key here. Like it's going to happen with or without you have them do it in a responsible manner. And that is why like. We, so in the, the scaling AI courses, I mentioned, I have an entire course on building generative AI policy and like what needs to go into it. And it should be day one training for interns, for associates, for everybody. Like tomorrow there should be generative AI policies that are rolled out to your people that guide them and put guardrails in place, but give them the freedom to use these things responsibly without the risk that it is so worried about and rightfully so. Um. So yeah, I, I just thought it was a really funny way. And I actually mentioned this in a talk last week. Like I used this quote as like an example to a, a, a conservative organization, like an organization that's very risk adverse. And uh, we got some laughs and because they knew it was true. <laughs> All right. So next up, we uh, have some news about Descript, which is a popular AI audio and video editing tool that we love and use at the Institute. They just announced a new AI editing assistant called Underlord. So if you're wondering about that name, here's how Descript uh, explains this. Quote, nobody wants an AI overlord, but everybody can use an AI underlord, an editing assistant that can do all the tedious stuff, but leaves you in control. So from what I can tell, Underlord seems to be kind of a package of both new and some existing AI features in the platform. You can do things like 
remove all your retakes on a video except for the best one, leverage the existing studio sound features to clean up audio, remove filler words automatically, uh, use a single click to center the active speakers in clips. Um, there's some AI multicam features that automatically cut to whoever's talking. And you can do things like turn long form video into short form clips. And then there's a ton of other generative AI features to do like translations, draft titles, and write social posts. So Paul, our team is certainly heavily invested in using Descript. What did you make of the Underlord announcement? Uh, I think that the other, like the frontier model companies should borrow the branding team from Descript because it's a hilarious product. Man, <laughs> I mean, it's there, there, like a, a lot of these names, these companies come up with are really challenged. Um, yeah. and then like, they keep changing them because they realize they're not great names. Like I, as soon as I saw this, like, that's, that's just genius. Like that's such a funny name, but Descript is great. I mean, they, not only do we love the platform, they make amazing videos. They have an amazing creative team. I, I think I've seen they, they have an outside. Uh, team they work with on some of this stuff but uh yeah i just i thought it was great and I, I mean they pump out new ai stuff monthly and you know claire on our team is constantly trying to keep up with what they've got going on and being able to infuse it into how we use descript so yeah if you don't use descript check them out like we love it they're not a sponsor i'm not doing this because they're paying us we just think it's an amazing platform so in another kind of product focused update, we've been experimenting with perplexity pages. So this is a new feature in perplexity that automatically creates pages on a topic for you based on your curated searches. And we've also been following a little controversy around the new feature. So a bunch of people are uh, getting upset, a lot of media outlets, because it appears that some news outlets say Perplexity Pages is pulling in content summaries that seem very similar to the original articles the content is pulled from. So a high profile example of this is a story that was in Forbes that one of their editors um, basically says it is ripping off most of our reporting. It cites us and a few that reblogged us as sources in the most easily ignored way possible. Perplexity CEO responded saying, thanks for the feedback. We agree with it. We're going to make it a lot easier to find the contributing sources and highlight them more prominently. So Paul, kind of two parts to this. You've done some experiments with perplexity pages. Can you maybe walk us through your impressions of that, but also kind of what's going on with the controversy about this? Yeah. So this probably falls into the category of some tech people built a cool thing and put it out into the world and didn't consider the ramifications. Yeah. So the first thing that, okay. So I was building the scaling AI series, the t course 10, what's next. I wanted to talk about super intelligence. Um, so I built some, a slide about super intelligence. And then I was like, oh, let me, this is probably be a good test for perplex perplexity pages. They'd come out like two days earlier. So I went in and I, I built a page about artificial super intelligence and it was like super easy to edit. He's, you know, did a great job. Like it was pretty cool. It was like Wikipedia on demand. Basically you build your own Wikipedia page and then you just make it public. So I put it on LinkedIn. I was like, Hey, this is pretty, pretty slick. Didn't get into the ramifications of it. And then mm -hmm. I see the tweet from John, uh, Pag Pagowski and he said, this is the one you're referring to, I think. You scraped and repurposed investigative reporting gathered over months, fleshed it out with reblogs of the same story by other outlets, and do not even bother to name us in the regurgitated post beyond a sources link, which is click to expand. Mm. That's a problem. Like that's, that's plagiarism, like, um, pretty, pretty cut and dry plagiarism. So then, uh, Sarah Emerson, who I think you mentioned, this is the Forbes one. That's when she says perplexity is scraping the work of journalists at Forbes, CNBC, Bloomberg, and other pubs claiming in tiny missable footprints are fair credit. In our case, it also listed text and artwork. So I, um, that was when I tweeted, not sure perplexity has seen its first lawsuit yet, but might be time to make a few phone calls and set some of that funding aside. As I've said many times, IP attorney may be the safest job in knowledge work for the next decade. And the fact that the CEO replied and I was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah we're, we're going to fix that. No, that product doesn't come to market without that being fixed. You're going to get sued. Like mm -hmm. that isn't it, it again, it's just move fast, break things, not just product wise, but like legal wise. Mm -hmm. And it is it again, it's like this, is it incompetence or is it arrogance? And I, I think it's both like, you can't do this. It's just like. It's so frustrating to watch stuff like this, where 
they have this obvious major issue and they just put it into the world and then mm -hmm. say, oh yeah, sorry, we'll fix that in a future version. No, it's illegal. You can't do it. I don't know. It, it, I mean, this is just like the state we're going to be in, in perpetuity because this is how um, Silicon Valley works. But man, is it frustrating to watch. And so great product uh, is probably going to get them in trouble. Mm. All right. So next up, AI video generation tool Pika, which we've talked about before, has raised $80 million in a Series B round led by Spark Capital and also participated in, among others, uh, by actor Jared Leto. This values Pika at $470 million, just a little over a year after it was founded. So... Paul, this definitely, we know Pika is kind of a major player here, but this kind of sets them up even in a better position. Like we've got Sora coming from OpenAI at some point, making a ton of waves. Runway is another huge player in the space. They have $236 million plus dollars in funding and are valued at $1.5 billion. Are we expecting the AI video generation startup market to kind of take off here? Yeah, I think it's going to be huge. I, I, I just, I'm really interested to see who gets acquired first. Yeah. Like, it just seems like these are natural acquisition targets for an Adobe or mm -hmm. Google or, I mean, OpenAI doesn't seem to be in the acquisition phase for stuff like this. They're building their own stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, I'll be fascinated to watch how this plays out. But yeah, a lot of people are doing this. Meta's doing it. Like everybody's in this space. And I think 2025, we're going to see kind of an explosion of video capabilities and they'll probably become more accessible, like built right into Gemini or... Uh, chat GPT, maybe it's like, and I'm also just like, how do you do the pricing model? Like, is this a mm -hmm. premium? Like said, am I 20 bucks a month? Do I, do I go to 30 and not, now I get video production capability built in? Um, yeah. So more of like a, a business perspective, I'm just fascinated to watch how this plays out. All right. In our last topic today, we just got from McDonald's, uh, AI focused commercial that's in partnership with HeyGen, which is an AI tool that generates synthetic voices and avatars. In this commercial, McDonald's has unveiled kind of an experience that they're calling, quote, sweet connections. And this is like a tool where anyone can record themselves giving a message in the language of their choice, then have HeyGen basically make a video of them giving the message that translated into a completely different language. So in the commercial, kind of the way they set this up is they give this experience to connect younger generations with grandparents who don't speak the same language as them. So you see a bunch of different examples of this in the video. And it's, you know, super notable, positive, kind of heartwarming commercial. What do you think of kind of the ad and the use case here? I mean, it's certainly a more optimistic use of technology that can also apparently be used to make pretty realistic deep fakes. Yeah, I think it's... Yeah. It is interesting that kind of like giving credibility to, to that technology. Yeah. Um, but I think it's just an example of how it's just, AI yeah, is just going to be absolutely everywhere. Like by the fall, it'll be in all of our devices. Billions of people who've never used an AI tool are going to now use it. Um, you know, there's, I think we saw the study that only like 7% worldwide have tried chat GPT. Well, that's mm -hmm. going to change. Like it's going to be built into <laughs> your device for free. So I think we're just over the next six to 12 months, like AI is just going to permeate throughout society and it's going to be built into brands. It's going to be built into campaigns. The one thing that's interesting here is like, it took humans to come up with how to use PageN in these campaigns. Like a human conceived of this and, you know, thought of the ways to apply AI in, in really creative ways. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes back to that idea we talked about earlier, you know, episode of this prediction machine concept of like the future is knowing what to tell the machine what to do and then knowing what to do with the output. And so I, I think this is a sign of, you know, positive things it can do to creativity. It's going to open up all these possibilities for new campaigns and new ideas and new products and services. And the humans who figure that out and become savvy at this stuff have enormous potential to do some really amazing things and, and be more creative. And so that's, I don't know, kind of end on a positive note. Like, I think it's it's kind of a neat thing to see how people apply this stuff. Yeah, I was going to say, it's good to end on that positive note after, you know, companies moving fast and breaking things, super intelligence. So I think this aware. is a good <laughs> Yeah. 
<laughs> awesome. Well, Paul, thanks again, as always, for breaking down what's going on in AI this week. Just a couple really quick final reminders. If you haven't left us a review on your podcasting platform of choice, please do so. It helps us get the show into as many people's hands as possible and helps us improve. Uh, also, a quick note, the podcast schedule, like Paul mentioned at the uh, top of the episode, we are taking a two-week break for some travel, so the next episode will drop on July 2nd. And last but not least, please check out, if you have not already, our newsletter at marketingaiinstitute.com forward slash newsletter, which summarizes all of the news we just covered on this episode and all the stuff we didn't have time to get to each and every week. Paul, thanks again. Yeah, enjoy the couple of weeks off. And, and one final reminder again, scalingai.com, June 27th. I'm going to do the webinar, but I'll also do some Ask Me Anything uh, after that. So if you want to catch up and you're missing the show that week, you can join us on Thursday, the 27th, and uh, we'll be doing a live webinar with Q&A. So uh, thank you. Have a great couple of weeks, everyone. We will talk to you again on July 2nd. Thanks for listening to The AI Show. Visit marketingaiinstitute.com to continue your AI learning journey and join more than 60,000 professionals and business leaders who have subscribed to the weekly newsletter, downloaded the AI blueprints, attended virtual and in-person events, taken our online AI courses, and engaged in the Slack community. Until next time, stay curious and explore AI.